Welcome everyone to FASIB's election 2022, unpacking the results and the impact on science funding and policy. My name is Ellen Hua. I'm the Associate Director for Ledge Affairs at FASIB, and I'll be introducing our three speakers today. Um, during our presentation, please do not quote any of our speakers without permission so we can be as candid as possible. This is being recorded and will be available as a link after the uh, webinar is over. So you may contact me if you have any questions about that. Our first speaker today is Greg Giroux. He's the senior reporter at Bloomberg Government and co-host of the Down Ballot Counts podcast. Giroux analyzes campaigns, elections, political data and the financing of federal elections for Bloomberg politics. He joined Bloomberg in 2010 and previously worked at CQ Roll Call. Our second speaker today is Brittany Washington. She's the legislative analyst with Bloomberg government. Washington covers trade, defense, foreign affairs and veterans affairs. And today she will also be covering some life science issues for us. Prior to joining BGov, she worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative aide and a congressional fellow. She has her master's in international relations from the Fletcher School, Tufts University, and her bachelor's in Japanese from Georgetown University. Our third speaker today is Maureen Hollihan. She's the co-founder of Advise Solutions, a management consulting and advocacy firm. Maureen is a federal appropriations and policy expert with both executive and legislative branch experience. From 2001 to 2019, she held multiple senior positions for the House Appropriations Committee, including Deputy Staff Director. She started her career as an analyst at the Food and Drug Administration. Our first two speakers will each have 15 minutes, and our last speaker will have 20 minutes. And at the end, we will do Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. I'll hand it over to Greg. Great. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you all for joining this uh, post-election rundown, unpacking the results. I'm Greg Giroux, an elections uh, reporter for Bloomberg Government, and last Tuesday's vote marked my 13th election as a reporter in my seventh midterm. Uh, perhaps I should use the present tense because it's still going on and uh, will for weeks more, almost two weeks after the election. We still don't know the final margins in the House and the Senate, although we know we are headed for divided government. I'll start sharing my screen. So I've got a slideshow for you here. Okay. All right. There we go. Uh, even as we await a uh, outcome of full U.S. House and U.S. Senate election results, it's clear the November 8 election uh, produced an extraordinarily and historically close result. Depending on what happens in the December 6 runoff election in Georgia, we will either reprise the 50 50 Senate we've had over the past two years with Democrats leading the chamber with Vice President Harris's tie-breaking vote, or Democrats will control the chamber by 51 to 49. The precise balance of, of power in the House hasn't yet been determined, but Republicans will control it with one of the smallest governing majorities in history after making minimal gains that, while sufficient to win control of the chamber, were much lower than anticipated by both Republican and Democratic strategists. Democrats defied expectations in bucked history, especially in light of President Biden's mediocre approval rating. As we see here, when a president's approval rating on midterm election day is in the low 40s, as Biden's was, it usually leads to the opposition party making large seat gains in Congress. In midterm elections between 1946 and 2018, the average result was the White House's party losing 26 seats in the House. It looks like Republicans are going to gain eight or nine seats. It's clear there was more of a row wave than a red wave. Since that Dobbs decision in late June, Democrats overperformed in elections held in Alaska, New York, Nebraska, Kansas, all over the country. There are other reasons why Democrats did better than expected in the November 8 election, but I think that Dobbs decision helped to close the, enthousia, the, the, the gap in voter, voter enthusiasm between Republicans and Democrats. Usually in midterm elections, there's more energy and enthusiasm with the opposition parties voters that are eager to send the governing party a message and put a check on the president rather than give the president a blank check. Uh, the election was a major setback for Donald Trump and his wing of the Republican Party in key elections for governor, state secretary of state, uh, US House, US Senate. Uh, Trump's preferred candidates lost more, far more often than they won. 
uh, in, in competitive races, um, including uh, sometimes by double digits. Having said that, despite a clear Republican underperformance in those elections on November the 8th, Republicans will uh, control the House and the leadership posts and the committee chairs that come with capturing that majority. You know, more on the House in just a minute, but let's look more closely what happened in the Senate elections on November the 8th. Uh, here we see the Senate balance of power for the next Congress, uh, 50 Democrats, including the two independents and 49 Republicans. Uh, the Democrats are the defending party in 15 Senate elections. They've thus far gone 14 for 14 with Georgia undecided. Republicans were the defending party in 20 Senate elections this year, and they successfully defended 19 of those seats, their lone loss. And the only Senate seat where there was a shift in party control at all was in Pennsylvania, where Democrat John Fetterman won the seat of retiring Republican Pat Toomey. If Herschel Walker is elected in Georgia, that would be a shift of a Democratic held seat to the Republicans. And if Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is reelected in Georgia, it would mark the first time in the century plus long history of the direct election of senators that no senator seeking re-election was defeated in either the primary or the general election. That's pretty extraordinary over a sweep of 100 plus years. We also have an undecided race in Alaska where I expect that Republican incumbent Lisa Murkowski will prevail over Trump endorsed Republican Kelly Chewbacca in a second round ranked choice voting tabulation that Alaska will conduct on Wednesday. Now about that Georgia runoff uh, two weeks from tomorrow on December the 6th, the two main differences between this runoff and the one that Warnock won in January, 2021 is that this one is being held earlier in December. And secondly, this runoff won't determine the control of the Senate, just the margin. So it may not attract the huge turnout of the January, 2021 runoffs that Warnock and John Ossoff won and that delivered the barest possible Senate majority for the Democrats. Republicans may be uh, disconsolate after losing the majority that, that may put a damper on voter turnout. And Walker this time uh, won't be sharing a ballot with Republican Governor Brian Kemp who won re-election comfortably on November the 8th. Democrats may need to guard against complacency if some of their voters start to think, hey, you know, we've won the Senate, we don't need Georgia. But if Senator Warnock is reelected, it would give the Democrats a 51st seat, and that would be important for several reasons. First, it would help Democrats with the committee membership ratios. Right now, the committees are evenly divided between the two parties, and sometimes that led to tie votes and committee on nominations, and Majority Leader Schumer would have to file a petition to discharge that nomination to the Senate floor. Democrats won't have to rely as much on Vice President Harris to break ties for 26 tie-breaking votes in just two years already are the third most in US history. And I think that also underscores how polarized our politics is and how ideologically homogenous and distinct the two, politically, two political parties are with so many 50-50 party line votes. And with 51 votes, Democrats would obviously have a little bit more breathing room and afford to have one Democratic defector on a party line vote, be it Joe Manchin of West Virginia or Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. Democrats aspired to, but fell short of the 52 votes they wanted to make changes to filibuster rules that uh, Manchin and Cinema oppose. And a 51st seat for Democrats would also give them a bit of a cushion ahead of a 2024 Senate election that's going to be very challenging for that party. Now, it may sound very premature to even broach a discussion about the 2024 Senate election, but um, senators who are up for re-election that year are going to be making their political plans known very soon in the next few months, I would think. And I think it's always instructive to watch the voting behavior and legislative work of members of Congress who expect to be in competitive races. And if you look at this map of states holding Senate elections in 2024, there's a lot more Democratic blue than there is Republican red. The Democrats will be the defending party in 23 elections and the Republicans in just 10. I think the big three senators to watch are Joe Manchin of West Virginia, John Tester of Montana and Sherrod Brown of Ohio. They're the only three Democratic senators from states that Donald Trump won in the 2020 election. Uh, all 10 Republican senators up for re-election in 2024 from states Trump won twice. Um, in a 50, whether the Senate's 50-50 or 51-49, any absence, illness, or death um, is gonna carry outsized significance in a chamber so closely divided. 
The Senate leadership rosters will remain the same. Chuck Schumer will return as Senate Majority Leader and Mitch McConnell as Senate Minority Leader. Senator Patty Murray of Washington State, now the number three Democrat in the leadership, will relinquish that post to instead become chair of the full Appropriations Committee and also become Senate President pro tempore, which is third in line to the presidency after the vice president and the U.S. House Speaker. Uh, Bernie Sanders of Vermont is in line to become chairman of the Health Committee. Uh, Murray's ranking Republican member on appropriations will be Susan Collins, along with new House Appropriations Committee Chair Kay Granger and top appropriations Democrat Rosa DeLauro. They'll be switching positions. Um, women will hold all four positions on the Senate and House Appropriations Committees, uh, known as the Four Corners. And uh, health funding is something very important to both Murray and uh, Collins, as I'm sure everyone on this call is already aware. Uh, we'll have a small Senate freshman class because either zero or one incumbent will be defeated. Um, some new senators worth watching and mentioning include John Fetterman uh, and also Alabama Republican Katie Britt, a former chief of staff to her retiring ex-boss, uh, Republican uh, Senator Richard Shelby, a senior appropriator. At 40, Britt will be the youngest Republican woman to ever serve in the Senate. On the next slide, we'll look at the House balance of power in the next Congress set to convene on January the 3rd. At the moment, it's 218 Republican, 212 Democratic. Um, it's really 219 Republican now that um, Lauren Boebert's Democratic opponent has conceded that race, um, even though it could still technically go to a recount. We have three uncalled races in California and uh, one in Alaska. And if you were to assign the uh, remaining uh, uncalled races to the party that's currently leading, that would come down to Republicans having a majority of 222 to 213. I'd note that would be a precise partisan mirror image of the House that we have now. Whatever the balance of power in the House ends up, it will still be among the closest in history. Uh, not many House incumbents lost their seat on November the 8th, just nine in fact, but the most conspicuous incumbent defeat may have been Sean Patrick Maloney, the chair of the House Democrats campaign arm who was unseated in a Hudson Valley district, Biden won by 10 percentage points. These House elections were the first held under new congressional district maps that were drawn by legislatures, governors, redistricting commissions, or the courts. In most of these states, these new maps will be on the books for the decade. Um, usually after redistricting, you see an uptick in the number of competitive districts because incumbents are facing new voters. Many of them choose to retire. Some states gain districts, some states lose them. And, um, but there were only 33 districts that Biden or Trump would have won by fewer than five percentage points in the 2020 election. And we had fewer competitive races two weeks ago than we might have expected in a normal redistricting year. We live in a closely divided nation, but we don't have too many closely divided congressional districts. We know that the next Congress will be among the most closely divided in history. Uh, look at uh, some other narrowly divided Congresses in recent history. You've got the 83rd Congress in 1953-54. Um, uh, Democrats won back both chambers of Congress in 1954 and wouldn't relinquish them until 1980 in the Senate and 1994 in the House. 107th Congress in 0102 began with the 50-50 Senate um, after George W. Bush's uh, narrow victory. Um, Republicans had the a uh, tie-breaking vote with Dick Cheney, but uh, the Senate, you may recall, flipped to the Democrats after Jim Jeffords decided to switch parties midway through 2001. And then a few months later, we had 9-11, and that really overhauled a lot of things, including the legislative focus. And there are a lot of bipartisan votes on um, anti-terrorism policy, like the Patriot Act, creating the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and uh, authorizing use of force in Afghanistan and Iraq. Then of course, the most recent Congress, we're still finishing up the 117th, uh, 222 Democratic, 213 Republican, if you had a vacancy, 50-50 in the Senate. I think what was notable about the Democrats in the House and certainly in the Senate as well is that how they were able to get, um, especially in the House, a lot of their agenda passed with a very slim majority. Um, they had very few defectors on major legislation, uh, zero or one on big bills like the American Rescue Plan Act or the Inflation Reduction Act. And a big question I think for this slim House Republican majority is can they forge party unity like House Democrats did this Congress? How willing will the most conservative anti-establishment of Republicans be in accepting imperfect compromises? We'll have to wait and see. I think managing the House Republican conference is going to be much harder for McCarthy if he becomes speaker than it was for John Boehner or Paul Ryan. 
when Boehner resigned from Congress um, seven years ago, uh, there were 247 Republicans in the House. Uh, McCarthy, whoever leads the Republican Party, uh, will only have 222 or 223. McCarthy is going to have to be mindful of the House Freedom Caucus. That's a block of several uh, dozen strongly conservative anti-establishment Republicans who have been at loggerheads with the leadership and often vote against government spending compromises that uh, the, the two parties' uh, leaders have hatched before. He's going to require almost all their votes if he's to win the speaker's election, McCarthy, uh, on in a public vote that will occur on the House floor January the 3rd. Then the House Republican Conference is going to have a block of Republicans with very different political priorities in the Freedom Caucus uh, because they were just elected or reelected in districts that Biden won in 2020 and they may and may well again in 2024. Unlike the Freedom Caucus, these Republicans from Biden districts are going to be much more compromised minded and very loath to engage in government shutdowns or debt ceiling showdowns or to impeach Biden or executive branch officials. There'll be at least uh, 16 Republicans from districts that Biden carried in 2020. You wanna watch their voting behavior in the upcoming 118th Congress. Excuse me. Um, Expect more, um, I think, unity in the House Democratic Caucus and the Republican Conference in part, because Democrats are now shifting to be the opposition party. And uh, it's easier to kind of, I think, forge party unity in the House opposition than as the House majority. But I think, uh, you know, McCarthy, uh, presuming he's the leader of the House Republicans and Speaker, uh, he'll may have to come to uh, um, Democratic leaders from time to time to for the votes he'll need to pass government spending bills that maybe some on his right flank may oppose. And we will have a new block of House Democratic leaders for the first time in 20 years following uh, the departure in, from the leadership post of Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, and Jim Clyburn. The top three House Democrats in the 118th Congress will be Akeem Jeffries of New York, Catherine Clark of Massachusetts, and Pete Aguilar of California. And I'm coming right up on 15 minutes right near as I was completing my formal remarks. And usually it doesn't work that way. Usually I go a bit long, but I'm gonna cut off right here end at 15 minutes and turn over the program over to my BGov colleague, Brittany Washington. Thank you so much, Greg. And uh, thank you to Ellen and FASA for the opportunity to speak today on the lame duck. Um, let's see here, I'm gonna share my screen. I think Greg needs to stop his share. There we go. Yep, one at a time, there we go, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm gonna dive right into it. Um, given the shift in, in power in the House, as Greg described, um, Democrats are going to be looking to clear as much unfinished business as possible um, before um, uh, the new Congress. So two things that are going to dominate the agenda during the lame duck will be government funding and the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, appropriators have until December 16th to act on government funding and are considering a possible omnibus package running through fiscal 2023. Um, lawmakers are also planning to wrap up NDAA, which is must pass legislation and armed services staff have already been working on a compromise defense authorization bill. And we've been hearing that the house could uh, take up that measure as early as the first week of December. Um, so the NDAA and a spending package could uh, be loaded up with ride-along provisions on immigration, COVID-19 aid, uh, federal health program extensions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But looking ahead to next year, um, Republicans will likely step up oversight of the Biden, administra Biden administration after uh, winning control of the House. So um, I just want to laser in on two committees quickly. Um, the House Energy and Commerce Committee, which will likely be chaired by uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers. Um, Republicans on the committee want to bring key Biden administ administration officials in front of the committee for questioning about um, the administration's response to COVID um, and other key health issues. Um, House Republicans have already launched probes into various public health agencies in the fall and have signaled that they are willing to continue to do that. Um, and, and bring health officials in for questioning on um, 
research and biomedical related issues. Um, the panel could also focus on price, pricing for both health services um, and prescription drugs. And then um, just quickly pivoting to um, the health science panel, which um, Frank Lucas uh, will likely be vying for chair and Zoe Lofgren will likely be the top Democrat on that panel um, after uh, Congress or chair um, Eddie Bernie Johnson's retirement. Um, they're looking to uh, keep CHIPS Act implementation at the top of their list of priorities. Um, and as you know, that law authorized billions of dollars in science research. Um, and so one key issue to look out for during debates on spending for FY 2023 and going forward is how will Congress make trade-offs um, to appropriate the money authorized in that, in that bill, or in the law, excuse me. Um, so just as a visual, so you can see how much time Congress has left to get all of the things it has to do done. Um, the lame duck session is uh, likely to run through December 21st. Um, it could slip. But um, if that is the case, the Senate will have about 18 working days after the Thanksgiving recess, and the House will have about 12 working days. So again, Congress has a lot to get done in a short amount of time. Um, so I did mention a couple of potential policy riders uh, for NDAA and, and omnibus package. Um, and I know that ARPA-H is a um, important issue for FASIP. So I wanted to dive into that a little bit. So. As you know, ARPA-H is ramping up after it received about $1 billion in funding in the fiscal 2022 spending package. It's possible that the agency could receive additional funding in a potential omnibus package. Um, uh, the House Labor HHS education bill would provide about uh, $2.7 billion uh, for the agency and the Senate drafts uh, measure would provide about 1 billion. Um, Another key issue is uh, ARPA-H's structure. Um, the agency has been designed right as a component of the of NIH, um, but there are efforts in Congress to make the agency a standalone HHS agency. Specifically, um, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo's bill, HR 5585, uh, listed here, which the House passed in June. Um, uh, it's a measure that would codify ARPA-H, make it a standalone agency, um, within HHS, it would authorize $3 billion uh, through fiscal 2022 for the agency and set term limits for the director. Um, and SU, the reason behind her, her legislation is that she wants ARPA-H to exist outside of NIH to ensure that um, agencies uh, is independent and um, that research duplication is avoided. Um, this is a bipartisan bill uh, excuse me, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers is the uh, co-sponsor on that bill. So there is, you know, a, it, it does have bipartisan support. And as you said that she is making it a priority to get it to the president's desk by the end of the year. Um, and you'll also see here that there are other proposals um, for ARPA-H uh, authorizations and um, uh, uh, excuse me, Senate 3799, that particular bill is from Senator Patty Murray. It's the Prevent Pandemics Act. And um, that bill is co-sponsored by uh, Senator Richard Burr. And um, it focuses on improving the nation's pandemic preparedness. Um, and so those senators have said that they hope to get their bill passed by the end of Congress, uh, or by the end of this year, um, but that could spill over into the next Congress. So that's something to look out for. Um, and then uh, the last proposal here is Cures 2.0, HR 6000. Um, and this bill didn't make it through committee. Uh, there was partisan debate about um, policy writers attaching drug pricing and um, uh, another writer on clean energy uh, to that bill. And so it got stuck in committee. And something else that I wanted to bring up, but I did not mention on this slide is that there are bipartisan delegations from Georgia, Illinois, Missouri, and other states that have sent letters to HHS asking um, the department to locate the new agency, to locate ARPA-H in their states. Um, and so a potential um, writer in a spending package, package could be a requirement for HHS to open a formal selection process for the agency's home. So that's um, a, another thing to look out for. And then um, a few other issues I like to touch on that might be of interest to FACIP 
um, is COVID-19 relief. Um, so we know that the Biden administration submitted a request for over $9 billion for COVID-19 aid last week. Um, that's less than half of the um, $22.4 billion it requested in September. Um, the funding that is requesting uh, that the administration is requesting is about $5 billion, uh, it includes $5 billion for research to support next generation vaccines. It also includes $2.5 billion um, for continued access to vaccines uh, to treat the uninsured and to maintain the national stockpile. Um, in addition to its uh, request for COVID aid, the White House is asking for $750 million to address other infectious diseases. That includes $400 million um, to restore the national stockpile with vaccines to treat monkeypox. Um, and another $350 million uh, will be directed to hepatitis C and HIV. Um, in terms of prospects, uh, House Appropriations Committee Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro said that Democrats intend to package the request with the full year omnibus and pass that before December 16th. But um, one thing to keep in mind is Democrats will need the support of at least 10 Senate Republicans to pass a spending package. And it's unclear um, whether Republicans will support the White House request. Um, you know, lawmakers didn't add the $22 billion um, that Biden requested uh, to, the, to the continuing resolution, as well as the uh, money requested for monkeypox because Republicans pushed back and said that the administration didn't provide enough information on previously appropriated funds. So um, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, the Biden administration has warned um, that funds could be exhausted by early next year. So it's certainly that uh, it's certainly an issue that Democrats will try to tackle um, in the lame duck, um, but it's just unsure whether or not um, Senate Republicans will be on board. Um, moving on to immigration, um, there have been efforts to ease green card access for immigrants with advanced degrees in STEM. And those um, proposals could be attached to a final uh, defense authorization bill. The Senate substitute amendment to the House defense bill does include language um, that would exempt US educated STEM doctoral and master's graduates from green card caps contingent upon US employment. Um, there was a similar provision in the House bill that was excluded from the final bill. Um, the amendment was removed because uh, the House Rules Committee said that there were jurisdictional issues related to fees uh, in the bill that counted as a tax. And so um, the provision was stripped. Um, however, the House bill does include language that would allow the US to admit a small number of essential STEM experts. So that's something to look out for um, during the discussions around NDAA in the next coming weeks. And then finally, um, I just wanna to touch on research security as well. Um, going back to the Chips and Science Act, there were a number of research security provisions that were dropped in the final, uh, in the final bill that came law. Um, and a few of those were directed at HHS. Um, the bill would have, well, the Senate version of the bill would have required the department to uh, require re recipients of biomedical research funding to disclose any participation in foreign talent programs. Um, HH HHS also would have been required to identify ways to better protect IP and sensitive information uh, participants in biomedical research. Um, there was also a provision that would have required State Department uh, or State Department sponsors of educational research programs to certify that they would comply with export license requirements related to control technology. So there were a few provisions that were dropped, um, but we are seeing some research security provisions in the NDAA um, that may be uh, important of importance to this group. And um, one in particular that comes to mind is um, in the House passed defense authorization, there's a provision that would require uh, DOD to assist systematically important entities or infrastructure um, that is important to critical supply chains in responding to cyber threats. Um, so uh, the in terms of you know research security, I think keeping an eye out on this final compromise measure um, that armed services staff is working on will be uh, important to facet. Um, and with that, I will turn over um, the I will turn over to Maureen. Uh, to talk about appropriations. Great, thanks, Brittany. Let me just screen share here. All right, let me pull my guys up. Here we 
¿no? All right. Okay. How does everything look? Ellen, we're good? Yes, you're good. Okay. Wonderful. Hi, everybody, and good afternoon. Um, I was I was really diving into what Greg and Brittany talked about, so um, it's very engaging, and I think we could have double the time on each of their talks easily, um, and it, it resonated with all of my experience. Um, as Ellen noted, uh, I was on appropriations for almost 20 years, and I was on multiple subcommittees, so I got to you know, see it from all different places. Um, you know, the, the committee staff, if any of you have engaged with them, they tend to be um, kind of have the longer, the longer duration, you know, and we'll talk through through this 20 minutes about personal staff, committee staff, um, and how they're different. But the committee staff are often come in and they are federal budget folks, policy analysts, they come from agency budget offices or policy areas, OMB, um, GAO, places like that. So it's a little bit of a different interaction than you may have with personal staff if you've done either of those. Okay, so here we go from inside the dome. Okay, so um, lots of stuff on this slide and don't worry, we're not gonna go down every little box on the right side. Um, this is really to show in principle what the process is supposed to look like. It is not like this in practice. Um, as we know, we have a lot of uh, things breaking down and we manage to use duct tape and band-aids and uh, just sheer will to get, to get this uh, spending bills done every year. And sometimes we uh, don't get them done and we have a shutdown. Um, and that's um, absolutely the opposite of what any member of the appropriations committee um, would want to happen. Um, shutdowns are the worst and full year continuing resolutions are kind of the second worst <laughs> in, that, in that game. And I'd love to talk to my colleagues about that. Um, so really the process on the right is just to kind of give us a framework for those questions that I've talked about over on the left. Um, uh, as we were planning this with Ellen, it was at what points are there opportunities for advocacy, you know, along, this is, you know, basically along a time frame. Um, when does, when do they occur? When not to talk to people, when not to bother them is, is um, really important too. Like you, you kind of have to know the cadence and what the staff are doing right now, that staff, um, house and Senate majority and minority doing appropriations are, you know, in a complete lockdown and, and, desperately trying to get things done so that um, if the will of the, the conference is there and they have the votes, they have a complete package and, and they can get a spending bill done. So that is that is always what's going on at this time of year. Um, it used to be October and September and now it's unfortunately uh, Thanksgiving to Christmas. Um, how can I engage with members and staff and how and when can I get information? So. I'll cover those questions um, going over to the right side and kind of going through a few of these um, pieces. Um, the president's budget um, really is the top thing that can get overlooked when we're talking about Congress, but it's incredibly um, important um, to any advocacy groups, anyone who wants to see funding or policy enacted. Um, the president proposes and Congress disposes, um, and we all know how that rolls. But the president's budget is, uh, despite all the um, all of the wrangling about you know policies and new funding lines, most of the president's budget gets enacted as it's requested. So the majority of that budget request um, makes it through this entire process down to that bottom uh, line in gray. So that's really your first. Um, your first thing to advocate for and be aware of and be interested in and be supporting is as that budget is being formulated. Um, when you have priorities and interests, um, that is the key, uh, a key place to place those, even if it might not be at the funding level you wish or with all of the you know, legislative policy that you might want, um, getting that 
tiny little, uh, that door open just a tiny bit um, is a, a critical piece. Um, the president, you know, proposes new starts and new things, um, and they're much more likely to happen than if it's a congressional idea, although Congress certainly does it too. So um, that's a great first start. Then if we kind of go down um, the left side, um, House Appropriations Committee and Senate Appropriations Committee, you've got, you know, you've got this basically the same process um, on each side. And they are considering that president's budget request. And they're looking at, um, it's the staff looking at it, you know, it's, and both per personal staff looks at it, but um, it's mostly committee staff, majority and minority, you know, for both sides. And they're really evaluating those proposals in that budget request um, from a practical um, standpoint, from a fiscal standpoint, and from a and with a political perspective, because you can't develop a product that you can't get enough votes to pass. So we're going to see all this play out. Um, the way it played out last year is, um, and where we sit right now with 23, is House Appropriations um, developed um, all of their bills and reports. They got all of them through their full committee. So you can see it's about two thirds of the way down right here. Um, and they got six through the floor. So they got six bills here and in this house floor and refer to Senate. So, um, so they are you know, basically halfway done. The Senate didn't get any bills or reports through committee at all. So they were basically stuck uh, right here before committee markup. So while there is a Senate position posted, it is not uh, position with any um, legislative standing. But it's a very good um, indication of the intention of Senator Leahy and where he would like all the bills to go. It did not have concurrence with the Republicans with Senator Shelby. Um, on the House side, the House um, is also basically a, a, a partisan bill. It didn't get any Republican support. So Republicans uh, withheld support um, through the process um, and they don't like the overall funding levels and the, the major decisions made um, in those bills, including um, a lot of policy decisions um, that are not going to be able to be sustained in conference with the Senate. So um, the points to, um, I'll move off this slide because this could take all day, um, the points really to kind of engage and have questions. Um, certainly look at the president's budget request, be aware of what's in there, know what you want to advocate for within the president's budget request or what you disagree with um, relating to the PB. Um, and then you can talk to um, you know, staff um, and uh, personal staff as well as committee staff. Personal staff, um, they're going to be more interested if their member either really has a particular interest um, in, you know, in some kind of some research for some disease or some type of research or if they have a, a connection to their district or state. So those are kind of great inroads with um, members personal offices um, and committee staff, you know, are often um, also receptive. Members send in requests to the um, appropriations subcommittees, both in House and Senate, and they, they can support program levels, they can support, you know, specific research projects, they can even ask for uh, community directed funding, which is we used to call earmarks. So that process happens right here along the hearings um, and you know during the time that, that that subcommittee is getting its allocation or its money allowance for what it can mark up. So through member offices, you can get member requests put into the committee. Um, so that is another kind of avenue that, the, and the committee, evaluates those and takes those very seriously. They want to be responsive to members. Um, you may also get, um, you may be involved in, in requests for information that come from the committee back to, you know, back to the department. The department, if you're very closely involved in a program, may consult you on that. Um, you can provide testimony into hearings, written testimony, and there's method that you can also do that. And that appears in the, in the hearing records. Um, so let me move to the next one. Okay. So it's important to note 
um, the 12 subcommittees that each of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees have, and they're organized um, partly historically. Um, for example, the Food and Drug Administration, where I worked, um, was the Bureau of Chemistry within the Department of Agriculture, and they sit in the Agriculture Subcommittee to this day, even though um, they are on the executive side part of the Department of Health and Human Services. That's irrelevant for the committee. Um, so sometimes they're organized politically, um, and sometimes and they've also kind of changed and modified over time. Um, most recently, with the Department of Homeland Security having the Homeland Security Subcommittee, that's the only one that's a direct, um, that's you know specific and direct to a department. So therefore, they also don't line up with authorizing committees. You'll have the Agriculture Subcommittee dealing with energy and commerce on, this is on the House side, energy and commerce and agriculture and, um, and the, um, for the feeding programs in schools dealing with um, ed and workforce. So you have three different major authorizing committees all kind of wanting to see things in that spending bill um, that's their priority, um, but the, the spending bill has to balance all of that out. So don't line up with the authorizing committees. They don't line up with the executive branch. Um, and then another difference just to note is you will have senators serving on both the appropriations subcommittee for that topic. For example, Senator Tester, he has the um, Veterans, the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee for Spending, but he also is the chairman of the Senate Veterans Affairs um, Committee, the major authorizing committee for veteran issues. So he's got both. So he can authorize something and then he can fund it, whereas the House, it's completely separate groups of people on those A committees. So a lot more um, having to kind of work together on the House side. Okay, so what does it look like when you're dividing funds up? Um, and this is, um, this was the big challenge that if you heard about, you know, Senator Shelby being concerned that there wasn't enough defense money in how Senator Leahy had laid out the allocations, this is exactly the issue. So um, the process goes that you have an overall level of spending that your budget committee has set for you. Um, through either through a formal process or through a deeming resolution. Um, and it's not the same for the House or House and Senate. So you're starting with a House version of your overall um, spending limit for the committee and a separate Senate version. They're working their own on their own process. Um, and this, so I pulled here, this is FY22 final enacted, just so you can see you know, where the money goes and, and where, where the big players are. Um, and this is 1.47 trillion. It does not include any of that COVID funding that was received, the American Rescue Plan Act, the, you know, all of those um, uh, infrastructure bills, the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Re um, Reduction Act, doesn't include any of this. This is your annual spending. Um, so you see, um, I'm sure you guys are well aware, uh, defense is, you know, half the money and um, Labor H is the largest non-defense um, portion of funding at, at almost um, 200 billion. Um, you know, then there's a couple other big, big pieces of pie that you might not have expected, uh, VA, MILCON. So that's maybe about $10 billion in MILCON and the rest is VA and some associated agencies. This is a huge piece of the pie that um, you might not expect, but certainly opportunities in VA, um, you know, on biomedical research. Um, so this is how it looks. Um, what they are dealing with right now over the past several weeks has been what's the conference version, this last one. Um, how do we portion out funding for each of these subcommittees so that we can take care of, of presidential priorities, the Biden administration, um, congressional priorities, congressionally directed funding, 
um, and get enough votes to pass this thing and get it across the, the transom to the president. Um, when, you're, when you've conferenced that omnibus bill that Greg talked about that um, Chair DeLauro has said that she, she intends to have a full omnibus, when you get that final, it's going to just be an up or down vote. So this is not a long time on the floor and it's not amendable at that point. Um, but you've got to put it together so you can get enough votes and, and you know, keep members of Congress um, connected, aware that you're taking care of their priorities um, and, you know, balancing things out um, in a, in a um, very important and delicate compromise. Okay, my last slide. So coming in on time, hopefully. Um, so Greg covered some of this. So this you know, this can be really quick. Um, it's kind of a who are the appropriators and uh, House Appropriations Committee, often called HAC and Senate Appropriations, SAC, uh, those, the big four um, have a major influence. So um, as Greg said, the 117th Congress, this is what it looks like. It's um, Senators Shelby and Leahy, and you can see they have, you know, they've worked together a long time and they know they need to work together to get anything done. So basically, you know, the Senate kind of compromises and works out their deal ahead of time, whereas the House doesn't. <laughs> um, the House is a little more, um, a little more rough and tumble. Um, so um, in the 118th Congress, you're going to have uh, Senators Murray and Collins um, in those new roles. There'll be a large amount of staff turnover. Senate, that's very typical in the Senate um, that, you know, you bring in your own team. So that'll be new relationships for you and your uh, any advocates to um, you know to meet with, um, and that's committee staff is what I'm talking about. And then um, uh, Ms. Delaro, uh, Chair Delaro, and Ranking Member Granger will likely just swap positions. Um, that's important for biomedical research that change in the House because Chairwoman Delaro is a huge advocate for. Um, all of that labor HHS bill, and she has kept that um, as her um, subcommittee in addition to chairing the full committee because it's that important to her. So, um, you know, she'll still stay on that, but obviously will be uh, in the minority side rather than the majority. Um, we expect um, in the 117th Congress, the House Appropriations Committee had 59 members in this um, breakout. We'd expect the committee to possibly shrink. It has always been and you know, in recent times, 50, 50 to 52 members. So we'd expect it to come back down. Um, the, the Senate's likely to stay about the same size and, and be evenly divided as you see. Okay, so um, hopefully that was helpful and I will stop sharing and um, have Ellen um, handle Q&A. All right, thank you, Maureen, Brittany, okay. and Greg. So I'm going to a lot. <laughs> yes, I'm going to take the first question here and ask you, you know, in terms of like sending out uh, alerts at this point to our members to get them to push for an omnibus, do you think that's something that we should be doing now, or is it kind of too late? Considering you know it's Thanksgiving week, we're People aren't really around except maybe committee staff. Um, I would say more like the latter, just, I, I mean, it, it may be something that if your organization says this is very important to finish this, to not have a shutdown and to not have a full year CR, finishing 23 is very important. Generally, I think members you know, can use that but as for details of what we want to see in it, I mean, I think that stuff's already really too far along the way. Um, certainly, um, all right, I'll, 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 I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's fine, thanks. And I, I have a question for Greg too. So Greg, in terms of, um, you know, the things that they are going to do in the 118th Congress in preparation for the next elections. I think you said it, you know, it would be more difficult, of course, just the dynamics up there. So 
what are the, the types of legislation that we can expect that will, you know, be more messaging pieces as opposed to really being completed in a in the next Congress? Yeah, messaging bills. We'll, we'll see a lot. I guess we'll see a lot of those. Um, you know, I, I think on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's not uncommon for, uh, it, like, in divided government, for one party to kind of push a bill that they don't expect will become law, but they, they want to get the opposite party to maybe cast some uncomfortable votes. They can kind of brandish in the next election. I don't expect that to be any different. Um, yeah, I, I, I expect that to continue. Um, you know, messaging bills we can expect. Um, you know, I, I'm sure the I'm sure the House House Republicans will want to. Uh, Pass some bills, maybe. I mean, they, they promised some, uh, you know, bills that would uh, expand, I say, domestic energy exploitation, for example. Um, that um, they, they could actually pick off, you know, some some Democratic votes like from Texas Democrats who could side on that. But I don't think those standalone bills would uh, would, would get through the Senate or certainly be vetoed by uh, Biden. But there, there are going to be some bills that I think the House Republicans will be eager to pass that, you know, maybe dare Biden to, to veto or dare the, the Senate to uh, to try and take up. Um, that, that's good. That you're going to see that, especially in modern uh, divided government. Um, and you know, and then on the other hand, I mean, I think uh, Biden and the, the, sl the slim Democratic majority are going to want to uh, push some bills and pressure uh, the, the the slim House Republican majority to act on them as well. Um, I think I think the bills yeah. I'm, I, I'm most uh, interested in watching are not meshing bills, but also the uh, the bills that you know the, the the really important stuff we have to pass to fund the government. And as I alluded to in my remarks, you know, will um, will um, you know, what is McCarthy going to do if they're, if presuming he's the speaker, whoever the Republican speaker is going to be, uh, what what is that speaker going to do if, as I mentioned, um, there is a significant uh, opposition to some spending bills on, on on the speaker's right flank? Um, will you just you just saw when Boehner was speaker, when Ryan was speaker, that um, you had a lot of uh, sometimes strange bedfellows where you'd have kind of the broad. Uh, Broadly liberal Democrats, broadly mainstream conservative Republicans, voting together on some government spending bills, and you saw maybe like the far right and the far left vote in opposition. You may, you may have, you may see that again. May I, may I chime in on that? Having mm -hmm. lived that one, mm -hmm. um, I would. I just want to have folks stay calm because you're going to see um, if it's not McCarthy, it might be someone even more radical um, from the spending perspective. Um, you're going to see, I'd expect it's McCarthy, and I'd expect rescission bills to come in um, in the in the spring, cutting spending that's already been enacted. Um, and I'd expect very low levels. I'd expect committee the committee to mark up in a completely partisan um, markup with very low non-defense discretionary levels. Um, and whether they can get those through the House, I don't know. But it's a bill, not a law. So I would say for advocates to just stay the course, um, you know, continue to advocate, continue to keep your good relationships that you have, and just know that that's the bumpy part of the process, and that's not what the Senate's going to agree to in the end. So on the on the spending bill side, you'll see you'll see low numbers, but not to panic. But you know, take them seriously and and. Um, don't just expect it to go away, but it, it's going to just take some time over the year. Brittany, did you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. I can talk about a couple other things that could be on tap for next year to look out for. Um, I think looking at, you know, bipartisan efforts, um, the farm bill is one um, that will come up next year. It's passed every five years. It includes funding for federal nutrition programs, farmer aid. It's usually a bipartisan lift. Um, this isn't as, um, probably not as significant for this group, but, uh, FAA reauthorization is also another big issue for next year. Um, that will end, I believe in September of 2023. Um, so I can imagine that there'll be a bipartisan push to get that through, um, to make sure aviation programs are authorized, um. And um, there are, you know, a number of different issues that I talked about before that, you know, could get punted to next year. Immigration is a big one. Um, uh, the debt limit is another one. Um, Greg talked about energy permitting. So um, there's there are a lot of things that, uh, you know, could could we could see 
you know, get pushed into uh, the 118th Congress. Um, but it all depends on, you know, what they can wrap up um, in the last few weeks they have this year. I, I would say if there's anything that's interesting um, on the funding side for R&D um, in the infrastructure acts that are already made law, I mean, that's a great place to focus because you have the certainty that those, the IIJA or the bipartisan infrastructure law that now just had its first birthday, money with that is still flowing out. There's a lot of new research programs, as well as in the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of climate focused stuff. So agencies that got money through those um, are, you know, implementing, doing guidances, you know, doing uh, federal register notices. So those are all really good places to look and and that's not going to have the bumpiness of these other of annual appropriations. Okay, and an, another question in terms of uh, the ARPA age legislation, Brittany. You mentioned, you know, the different placements of where ARPA age physically be located, as well as the the funding kind of stream. Because right now it's in the labor and HHS bill; it's under NIH's program level. And Maureen, you're happy to, for you to chime in too, but as NIH advocates here at FASM, what are your thoughts on where this RPH actually should be located within the kind of the budget for the labor HH, HHS bill? Wow, that is a really good question. I, um, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I may have to punt this one to Maureen. Um, you know, what I do know from looking at House proposals, Senate proposals, it's the funding stream is coming through NIH. I don't know what that will look like. If yeah. you say, uh, if say SU's proposal makes it through, clears the Senate, right? Um, and now it's, now the agency, if, in that case, the agency would be a standalone agency separate from NIH. I don't know how that would look. And, um, what I can say is, you know, if there is to be a structural change to our age, the longer that, um, or the more time goes by, the harder it will be to separate the entity mm -hmm. from uh, the agency from NIH. Um, and so that could also have implications for budget. Um, so yeah, that's something to think about. Um, you know, if if Ashley's proposal doesn't get through or Murray's proposal doesn't get through this year, and this is a debate that continues uh, to move forward. Um, you know what what would holding off on determining its structure, its location mean for uh, the budget process down the road? I guess I'm answering your question with a question, um, <laughs> but Maureen, if you have any thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's that's spot on. I mean, the, the debate is over both uh, ARPA-H having independence of thought and approach and then independence of budget. You know, so it's not, as, as Brittany said, once it gets kind of incorporated and you have people at NIH who might be half, you know, 50% of their time on one thing and 50%, that gets really muddled. The other piece is location isn't just organizational. It's physically, where is this place going to be and which members of Congress want it where? And so let's see what Senator Murray does. That's great. Let's see. Oh, oh. Okay, so anyway, uh, I want to thank everyone for your participation today. I think it was a very thoughtful discussion and giving us a lot to chew on about what we should do as advocates, frankly. So uh, again, Greg, Brittany, and Maureen, thank you so much for participating today. And uh, I'm going to sign off. Thank you for everyone's attendance. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.